The term Flat Earth Society has entered modern legend. The name has passed from mouth to mouth for years now, usually with slight incredulity, perhaps as a parable, perhaps as a warning, but likely with little knowledge of its origin, to the point when some may doubt it ever existed. But the Flat Earth Society was very real, and acted as a mildly comic, if somewhat pathetic, commentary on the concurrent space race. For much of its existence, the Flat Earth Society largely consisted of one man, Samuel Shenton, a sign painter who lived modestly in Dover, England. Fascinated by aviation, the young Shenton believed he'd invented a new form of powered flight, an airship that would remain stationary while the Earth rotated beneath it. He wondered why no one had ever thought of the idea before, and his researches on the subject eventually led him to, yes, Robotham a man whose combination of naivete, self-confidence, and blind ignorance were very like his own. Upon reading a copy of Zetetic Astronomy, Earth Not a Globe! Exclamation point, he was immediately converted to Zeteticism, even though its denial of the Earth's motion meant he could never build his cherished airship. In person, Shenton was, by all accounts, a fairly soft-spoken man who more resembled a stereotypical absent-minded professor than the raging car salesman usually associated with the fiery end of the creationist spectrum. But in writing, he pulled no punches. He denied the Earth's motion in the same grounds that Ptolemy did. How does the air not blow off the Earth with the force of a hurricane? And when told, because gravity, he claimed that gravity was, quote, hocus-pocus, that, quote, Newton himself denied. When asked, well, what if not gravity, he would reply, it's only the weight of an article that makes it fall, apparently unaware that Galileo had categorically falsified that notion 400 years ago. Like all his predecessors, Shenton based his beliefs on his interpretation of the book of Genesis, though he returned the old recipe of pseudoscience flavored with creationism, favored by Robotham, rather than the straight creationism of Lady Blunt. In 1956, Shenton declared his beliefs to the world by founding the International Flat Earth Research Society. Depending on your point of view, his timing was either completely catastrophic or shockingly perfect, for one year later the Space Age began with the launch of Sputnik. Much like the unlicensed hawkers and carnival barkers that circle the edges of state visits or national celebrations, the Flat Earth Society provided a kind of funhouse side attraction to the wonder and awe of the space race. Whenever the U.S. or the USSR made some significant leap into the final frontier, Shenton would be ready with a media-friendly put-down. The tabloids loved him, and he was frequently invited to give interviews to the less scrupulous end of the British media. He claimed the Sputniks were merely, quote, like marbles spinning around a saucer, and that they no more proved the Earth was a sphere than a boat would by sailing around the Isle of Wight. When Jean Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth, Shenton sent him an IFERS membership card with a note saying, OK, wise guy, science cannot shout us down, he would say, proudly and apparently without irony. When asked about the possibility of a moon landing, he retorted, quote, The moon is transparent, you know. Stars have been seen through the moon. There isn't anything much to land on. When the Soviet Union performed the first spacewalk, he cheered it as evidence of the absence of gravity. However, after the Gemini 4 American spacewalk, Shenton claimed spaceflight was impossible due to the firmament, the unbreakable dome holding up the sky in the Bible. The entire space race, he declared, was a government deception. His notoriety increased to such an extent that Frank Borman, commander of Apollo 8, mentioned Shenton by name when broadcasting the image of the spherical Earth to the world. But notoriety did not translate to wealth or well-being for Shenton. All those images of the sphere of the Earth had decimated membership of the Flat Earth Society, which fell from 200 to 24. His accusations brought thousands of letters to his home from all over the world, and the strain of answering them took a hideous physical toll. By 1963, Shenton had suffered a stroke. By 1968, his sign painting business had collapsed, and his health deteriorated even further. In the run-up to Apollo 11, the inundation of letters nearly broke him. He died in 1971, one year before the space race ended. After Shenton's death, the Flat Earth Society persevered, after a fashion, though it was now little more than a front for the globular conspiracy. Ellis Tillman, an eccentric London politician who had supported Shenton in the past, appointed himself president, though his zeal for the faith was questionable. 
given that he was also president of the Lewis Carroll Society. Patrick Moore, for decades Britain's primary public educator on astronomy, had interviewed Shenton twice and developed a peculiar affection for him. For God's sake, keep it going, he told Tillman when he questioned taking the mantle. We must have heretical people in the realm of astronomy. But Shenton's true legacy was the blessing he bestowed on the creation of two more flat earth societies, one in Canada and one, more significantly, in the U.S. While its impact on the history of the Flat Earth Movement has been slight, the Canadian Flat Earth Society deserves a brief mention here. Its founder was Leo Ferrari, another in a long line of mavericks and dedicated oddballs for whom the Flat Earth is irresistible. Despite graduating college with a degree in chemistry, Ferrari developed a passion for philosophy so all-consuming he eventually obtained a PhD in the subject and became a tenured professor of philosophy at St. Thomas's University in New Brunswick. Ferrari wore his eccentricity like a badge, embracing the humorous and the weird with gusto. He independently formulated the zetetic ideology of abandoning theory and drawing only on sensory experience. Though, unlike self-described zetetics, he didn't argue from a religious fundamentalist viewpoint, but saw his goal to thumb his nose at overly dogmatic scientific practices. From the beginning, Ferrari's establishment of the Flat Earth Society of Canada was done with tongue planted firmly in cheek, in a similar vein to Britain's monster-raving loony party or the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, a not-quite-wholly satirical organization designed to use the absurd to expose underlying hypocrisy. They cite Columbus as having proved the roundness of the earth, he wrote in the Society's founding precepts, then forget, gentlemen, that he sought to reach India by sailing west, and they also forgot he failed miserably. If the earth is round, there can be no up or down. Who gave them the right to place North America above South America? Why don't they leave cartography to those who know what they're doing? The society prospered for a while, before the inevitable clashes of too many idiosyncratic minds in one space led to its retirement. The Flat Earth Society of Canada is well remembered today. Indeed, there are plans to commemorate its crusade with a museum. But for our purposes, it is the Flat Earth Society of America that has had the most impact. With its combination of entrepreneurial self-made reality and sharp Christian certainty, the Flat Earth movement was always going to find willing ears in the States. An entire city, Zion, Illinois, owes its existence partly to enterprising Flat Earthers. But for our story, the American Flat Earth movement truly began with a man named Charles Johnson who founded the American branch of the Flat Earth Society and, after Shenton's death, received much of his records from his widow. Johnson was a paragon of the now familiar Zetetic personality. Absolute self-assurance combined with a rejection of any and all intellectual authority or alternate opinion. His tenure shifted the Flat Earth Society's ideological pendulum back toward hard creationism, with little or no pseudoscientific justification and a thoroughly modern dose of conspiracy. Johnson considered other creationists, quote, devils and phonies for accepting the spherical earth, and, once he'd cottoned on to the Canadian Flat Earth Society's intentions, decried Leo Ferrari as an atheist devil and, worst of all, an expert. Ferrari refused to answer Johnson's letters and kept them in a file marked, Hope He Goes Away. Claiming divine authority as his only inspiration, Johnson asserted that science was a sun-worshipping religion that had been founded in 1840. While his theology did touch on some familiar conspiracy tropes, he often took them in unexpected directions. For instance, he claimed that Columbus had discovered the world was flat, but it had been silenced by European sun cultists. The truth of the flat earth survived, however, and formed the basis for the founding of America. George Washington, of course, was a flat earther. Contrary to many conspiracy theorists, he saw the UN as a benevolent force, since its flag showed the earth is flat, and it must therefore be preparing the world to accept the final truth. Like Shenton before him, Johnson believed the space race had been staged. However, he also claimed that it had been orchestrated by Mormons, who had bankrolled it with the funds stolen from a kidnapped Howard Hughes. In 1986, he claimed the space shuttle Challenger had been destroyed by God, and in 1994, argued that O.J. Simpson had been framed for his wife's murder to discredit him for the role he played in the moon landing hoax. You see, Simpson had starred in Capricorn 1, a cheesy 70s sci-fi conspiracy flick about a faked mission to Mars, and that could only have been intended as a smokescreen to discredit the actual fake moon landing. At its peak, 
The Flat Earth Research Society of America claimed nearly 4,000 members. But, much like Shenton, Johnson admitted that the strain of defending his beliefs had taken a toll. When asked about the people's reactions to his beliefs, he said, Everyone likes to be liked, but you can't be liked. You have to make up your mind to do without that, because people stay away. In 1996, Johnson's modest house burnt down, taking all their records with it, including Shenton's archive. And with that, the Flat Earth Movement went back to sleep. But it would only be eight years before it rose again, this time on the natural home of the reality dissident, the Internet. And we shall be discussing its resurrection in the next episode.